same desire to behold the various kingdoms of the world which is urged on others excited me also to a similar enterprise. I deliberated in my own mind that I should see those which had been the least frequented by the Venetians. Wherefore, spreading our sails to a favourable wind, and having implored the divine aid, we committed ourselves to the sea. When we came to Alexandria, a city of Egypt, I, longing for novelty, as a thirsty man longs for fresh water, departed from these places as being well known to all, and entering the Nile, arrived at Cairo. On my arrival to Cairo, I, who had been previously much astonished at the account of its size, came to the conclusion that it was not so large as it had been reported to be. But its size and circumference is about equal to that of Rome. I say nothing about the riches and beauty of the aforesaid Cairo and the pride of the Mamelukes, because they are well known to our countrymen. So I sailed thence into Syria and went towards Damascus, which is distant ten short days' journey, and onwards. In 1503, on the 8th day of April, the caravan being set in order to go to Mecca, and I being desirous of beholding various scenes and not knowing how to go about it, formed a great friendship with the captain of the Mamelukes of the caravan, who was a Christian renegade, so that he clothed me like a Mameluke and gave me a good horse, and placed me in company with other Mamelukes, and this was accomplished by means of the money and other things which I gave him. And in this manner we set ourselves on the way, arriving at the city which is called Medina Thal Nabi. Now, some who say that the body of Mahmet is suspended in the air at Mecca must be reproved. I, I say that is not true. I have seen his sepulchre in this city, Medina Thal Nabi, in which we remained three days, and wished to see everything. The first day we went into the city, at the entrance by the door of their mosque, and each of us, small or great, was obliged to be accompanied by some person. Within there is a sepulchre, that is a pit underground, wherein was placed Mahmet. We remained there three days in order to give rest to the camels. Now, being tired of these things, we prepared ourselves to pass onwards, to Mecca. This video is sponsored by Skillshare, the online learning platform. Since production started on longer documentaries, I've been using Skillshare to hone my skills to really maximize their potential. One great example was the class Learn Premiere Pro with Halis Narvaez, a great class that helped me raise my level on the software needed for a YouTube channel. And that's Skillshare. Whether you're a professional or just starting out, it's a great resource for self-improvement and a great place to spark ideas, with thousands of classes fit for any schedule. And to start you off, the first thousand of my subscribers to click the link in the description will get a free trial of premium membership so you can explore your creativity and make the most of 2021. Thanks. We will now speak of the very noble city of Mecca, what it is, its state and who governs it. The city is most beautiful and it is very well inhabited and contains about 6,000 families. The houses are extremely good like our own, and there are houses worth three or four thousand ducats each. The city is not surrounded by walls. A quarter of a mile distant from the city we found a mountain, where there was a road cut by human labour. And then we descended into the plain. The walls of the said city are the mountains, and it has four entrances. The governor of this city is a sultan, that is, one of the four brothers, and is of the race of Mahmet and is subject to the Grand Sultan of Cairo. His three brothers are always at war with him. We entered from the north and afterwards we descended into the plain. On the side towards the south there are two mountains which almost touch each other, where is the pass to go to the gate of Mecca. On the other side, where the sun rises, there is another mountain pass, like a valley, through which is the road to the mountain where they celebrate the sacrifice of Abraham and Isaac, which mountain is distant from the said city about eight or ten miles. The height of this mountain is two or three casts of a stone by hand. You must know that I had excellent experiences of these Mamelukes during the journey. Amongst others, I saw a Mameluke take one of his slaves and place a pomegranate on his head and make him stand 12 or 15 paces distance from him and at the second trial strike off the pomegranate by a shot from a bow. Again, I saw another Mameluke running at full gallop, take off the saddle and place it on his head and afterwards return it to its original place without falling. 
Let us return to the city. You must know that, in my opinion, the curse of God has been laid upon the said city, for the country produces neither grass, nor trees, nor anything, and they suffer from so great a dearth of water that if everyone were to drink as much as he might wish, four Katrini worth of water daily would not suffice them. I will tell you in what manner they live. A great part of their provisions come from Cairo, that is, from the Red Sea. There is a port called Zida, which is distant from the said city 40 miles. A great quantity of food also comes there from Arabia Felix, and also a great part comes from Ethiopia. We found a great number of pilgrims, of whom some came from Ethiopia, some from India Major, some from India Minor, some from Persia, and some from Syria. Truly, I never saw so many people collected in one spot as during the 20 days I remained there. Of these people, some had come for the purposes of trade, and some on pilgrimage for their pardon, in which pardon you shall understand what they do. In the midst of the city, there is a very beautiful temple, similar to the Colosseum of Rome, but not made of such large stones, but of burnt bricks, and it is round in the same manner. It has 90 or 100 doors around it and is arched and has many of these doors. On entering the said temple, you descend 10 or 12 steps of marble and here and there about the entrance, there stand men who sell jewels and nothing else. And when you have descended the said steps, you find the temple all around and everything, that is the walls, covered with gold. And under the arches, there stand about 4,000 or 5,000 persons, men and women, which persons sell all kinds of odoriferous things the greater part are powders for preserving human bodies, because pagans come there from all parts of the world. Truly, it would not be possible to describe the sweetness of the odours, which are smelt within this temple. On the 23rd of May, the said pardon commences in the above-mentioned temple. The pardon is this. Within the said temple, and uncovered, in the centre, there is a tower, the size of which is about five or six paces on each side, around which tower there is a cloth of black silk, and there is a door all of silver, of the height of a man by which you enter into the said tower. On the 24th of May, all the people begin before day to go seven times around the said tower, always touching and kissing each corner. And at about 10 or 12 paces distant from the said tower, there is another tower, like a chapel with three or four doors. In the center of the said tower, there is a very beautiful well, which is 70 fathoms deep and the water is brackish. At this well there stand six or eight men appointed to draw water for the people, and those who draw the water throw three buckets over each person, from the crown of their heads to their feet, and all bathe even though their dress be made of silk. And all having thus bathed, they go by the way of the valley to the said mountain of which we have before spoken, and remain there two days and one night. And when they are all at the foot of the said mountain, they make the sacrifice there. Every man and woman kills at least two or three, and some four, and some six sheep, so that I really believe that on the first day more than 30,000 sheep are killed by cutting their throats, facing the east. Each person gives them to the poor for the love of God. There were about 30,000 poor people there who made a very large hole in the earth and put in it camel's dung, and thus they made a, a little fire and warmed the flesh a little, and then ate it. And truly, it is my opinion that these poor men came more on account of their hunger than for the sake of the pardon. And as a proof that it was so, we had a great number of cucumbers, which came from Arabia Felix, and we ate them all but the rind, which we afterwards threw away outside our tent. And about 40 or 50 of these said poor people stood before our tent and made a great scrambling among themselves in order to pick up the said rinds, which were full of sand. By this it appeared to us that they came rather to satisfy their hunger than to wash away their sins. In another part of the temple there is an enclosed place in which there are two live unicorns, and these are shown as very remarkable objects, which they certainly are. Truly this monster must be a very fierce and solitary animal. These two animals were presented to the Sultan of Mecca as the finest things that could be found in the world at the present day and as the richest treasure ever sent by the king of Ethiopia, that is, by a Moorish king. He made this present in order to secure an alliance with the said Sultan of Mecca. I must here show how the human intellect manifests itself under certain conditions. 
insofar as it becomes necessary for me to exercise it in order to escape from the caravan of Mecca. Having gone to make some purchases for my captain, I was recognised by a Moor who looked me in the face and said to me, Where are you from? I answered, I am a Moor. He replied, You are not telling the truth. I said to him, By the head of Mahmet, I am a Moor. He answered, Come to my house. And I went with him. When I had arrived at his house, he spoke to me in Italian and told me where I had come from and that he knew I was not a Moor. When I heard this, I told him I was a Roman and that I had become a Mameluk at Cairo. When he heard this, he was much pleased and treated me with great honour. I began to say to him, if this was the city of Mecca, which was so renowned throughout all the world, where were the jewels and spices? And where are all the various kinds of merchandise which it was reported they brought here? I asked him this, only that he might tell me why they had not arrived as usual. And when he told me that the King of Portugal was the cause, I pretended to be much grieved and spoke great ill of the said king, merely that he might not think that I was pleased that the Christians should make such a journey. When he saw that I displayed hostility to the Christians, he showed me yet greater honour, and told me everything point by point. I said to him, Friend, I beg you, tell me some mode or way by which I may escape from the caravan, because my intention is to go find those beings who are hostile to the Christians. Hearing this, he said, Mahmet be praised, who has sent us such a man to serve the Moors and God. So he concealed me in his house with his wife. When Friday came, I set out with the caravan at noon, to the no small regret of the said ladies, who made great lamentations. I cannot express the kindness I received from this lady, and especially from her niece of 15 years old, they promising me that, if I would remain there, they would make me rich. But I declined all their offers on account of the present danger. On Saturday we departed, and travelled until midnight, when we entered into the port of the city of Zida.